Bonjour à tous, je m'appelle Marco, je suis tellement content parce que maintenant nous avons un special guest, Robel Tui. Hi Robert! Oh, <laughs> Bonjour Marco, comment ça va? I had a whole ruse I was going to do and now we're speaking English. Robert actually is, is an American, <laughs> American conductor uh, who lives in France and works in France. Thanks so much for wanting to be here, Robert. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, of course. So the last time we were together, actually you were the conductor for my final like live performance uh, of Macbeth, which was a super pleasure and it was a really great great experience and we were just talking before about you know living in in Limoges for two months and speaking French and just the whole experience it was my first like international gig and my last subsequently but but it, <laughs> but it was really fun to you know be there and I actually think that in a lot of ways this is kind of special for me just because my life has changed so much since 2019 obviously and of course we had the pandemic and everything like that but I'm, I'm just so thrilled that you wanted to come on I don't want to take credit for it but I'm pretty sure when I was there in France uh, I introduced you to the Nintendo Switch. Is that correct? That is true uh, because you had traveled to France with your Nintendo Switch. Yeah. You basically told me what the system was and I thought it sounded so interesting. And then the following year was obviously the, the start of the pandemic. And so suddenly those of us in the performing arts had like, you know, months and months of work canceled and it really it was a very strange period. And so it was uh, the chance for me to sort of explore it a bit more and you know, fall in love with a couple of games. It helped me through a difficult period. We were talking earlier that you have played through Dark Souls 3, Elden Ring, and and obviously you have experience with the original Nintendo system. That's pretty much your, like, the gamut of your video game knowledge. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like, because, uh, I mean, I played when I was a kid. We had, the, you know, the Super Mario Brothers. Then a little bit later on, my parents had a Nintendo Wii. I love playing chess. I love board games, society games. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I dipped in with um, Breath of the Wild because I love the Legend of Zelda game when I was a kid. And then Elden Ring, I guess I sort of heard, I, I heard that there was this major game sort of coming out and obviously I didn't know anything about those games or anything. <laughs> How hard I, they are, yeah. Yeah, I, do, I just knew this <laughs> reputation like they're, yeah. they're maddeningly impossible and they're these cult bosses and it really ended up enjoying, enjoying that. And that's why I did play Dark Souls uh, 3 as well afterwards. Mm -hmm. I have to say that Elden Ring is, is surprisingly Wagnerian. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think because also it has this storyline because they have GRR Mark and working mm -hmm. on it. Did okay. you tune into the music a lot when you were playing it? Yeah, I thought the score was good for Elden Ring. A couple parts in particular, the Malekith sequence is fantastic, I thought. Yeah. It had me sort of thinking that video game music has some things in common with sort of film music. Whether or not it's sort of like background or foreground, it, sort of, it depends a lot on the context. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a great film composer is just, is not sort of like center stage, but it's just sort of helping make the ambiance right for, for what's happening. And then sometimes it has to sort of like, kind of like John Williams style or whatever the music really become center stage. I, I sort of found it to be um, quite surprised when I sort of like, you know, restarted pl playing a little bit to feel these sorts of like, based on some sort of like sound cue. Oh, wait a minute. What's going on here? Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Let's dive in. I have a bunch of selections for you from all sorts of different angles of the video game world. We've got some hardcore rock. We've got some Parisian cafe music. We've got some lots of orchestral wow. music uh, since that's where, you know, you, that's your bread and butter. And then we also have a lot of vocal music. <laughs> Can you hear that in like a like a back back alley like French cafe like something about that accordion I don't know what's your vibe from that the accordion especially at the very beginning that definitely has this sort of Parisian <laughs> cafe sort of like vibe yeah. I've never heard so much accordion in my life as uh, as I have in the past <laughs> yeah. that's just a really interesting sort of mix of a few different influences. Nice. Yeah, because we always talk about in singing this, like paying attention to the diction and using the words as like springboards and all this other stuff. And I feel like that particular song, when I listened to it, I was like, whoa, that's like really good diction. I have no idea what the hell that song's about, honestly, but but it, it like exudes a sort of like ex exuberance. Yeah, yes. But I, what I thought was super cool is like the, the music of that, like the sounds in that language sort of lend itself so well to practically like the voice becomes kind of another instrument with this, you know, with the clarinet. Yeah. 
super well sung, but also that has this almost a slightly instrumental kind of like uh, feel to it. Do you play piano? I forget. Are you a pianist also? Actually, my main instrument was the trombone. For very unlikely instrument for for a conductor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't see that often. That's hilarious. I didn't know that. <laughs> I play uh, piano basically in order to learn scores, if it's, especially for for learning opera. It's probably the most useful instrument because you can sit down, play it sing each role, try and get further into it. You, you don't pull out your trombone and just find the pitches. <laughs> What a musical journey. It's weird how a book ends like that too. You know, it has that beginning with the very simple three notes and then we end it's that's a very like classical method of finishing. I mean, we hear that often, don't we? Like where something starts one way and ends the same way, or do you feel like that's like a very, yeah, for sure. I think also if, if a composer is trying to tell us that there's some sort of like a uh, sort of journey, this idea that you go somewhere and somehow you kind of back in a way where you start, except that you're not the same because of what you've experienced in the middle. So so this can be really incredibly effective in, you know, and like opera composers use this all the time, symphonic composers use this all the time, where some sort of idea that we heard earlier in the piece, when it comes back, it doesn't operate the same role. I personally, like, I feel like it really like, it tugs at like, you know, the, the soul and kind of like, it's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, it's like Puccini lyrical writing in a lot of ways. I don't know what the story of that of that game is, but I'm sure that there's something emotional to it, because otherwise the, <laughs> the composer would write that. If, you know, if there wasn't some element of that into the story. There's a famous saying in the Ace Combat world, which is a fighter plane game. Uh, if the sky or seas speak Latin, you're in trouble. And so this is the first of actually a, basically a three a three piece symphonic movement called the Alicorn Trio. I think you'll you'll hear what I mean <laughs> when we get there. more or less sort of what I was expecting, kind of like almost action movie sort of music. The Latin chorus bit was not what, absolutely not what I, where, I, where I thought that was going. That was a very interesting turn of events. And that's the sort of thing that, that made me uh, make a little bit that connection between what some film music composers do. I was definitely hearing a little bit of uh, Hans Zimmer uh, influence at the the very, very beginning. Keiki Kobayashi is the composer. What's amazing is that he's the only composer I've heard that is able to take something that we in the classical music industry recognize as a very common theme using Latin lyrics to explain a, an emotion or a feeling or, you know, the DSA or whatever. This particular thing feels like it could be a modern day requiem. Like we could take all these instruments, put them in a symphony hall, and somehow all the Latin components of this just... You know, I can see where this guy, you know, it, maybe this is sort of his strength is to sort of really mix different, uh, you know, different elements from different sort of like sound worlds to come up with something that is really very, very su surprising to like the first, yeah. for first listen. Good. That was the reaction I was hoping I'd get.
That is pretty funny. My favorite part of this is the in the entrance of the organ right after after the you know the piano intro at the. It's really, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Here we go. Is that like too far out of your like comfort zone, or do you feel like like what I like about that is it reminds me of like you know like books to Hooter or like you know like a Bach toccata or something, no, but, 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 but also like totally nuts. But that's it. As soon as the organ starts playing, then suddenly we get this sort of like you know you know heaven and hell sort of like combat. Is it anywhere in your like wow I want to listen to that more? You think, or do you feel like that's more like mm, I think I could do without? No, I mean I, I I would need to know the kind of the context in the game. Very often. Uh, you know what really what what makes something effective or not is how we feel when we arrive at a certain moment in a in a game. Sometimes it's kind of like, but I, I guess I feel like this about uh, about pretty much everything. I remember taking a, a wine tasting sort of like exposition sort of uh, sort of thing, and this this guy who was this real you know absolute wine expert was saying that for him the idea of what is really a good wine kind of difficult to answer because it depends a lot on the context. What would be a good wine if you're like let's say you're at like a three star Michelin, uh, you know, mm-hmm, dinner. Mm-hmm. That's not going to be the same good wine as if you're having a picnic out in a park with your friend. <laughs> Music in general is, is is quite like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be like a you know like a Beethoven symphony or something like that. It's just the, exactly the perfect thing for what we need. What you need, yeah. Although you make an interesting point because I remember when I first listened to Madame Butterfly that, you know, it ended up becoming one of my favorite operas. When I listened to it in undergrad, I remember sitting there being like, oh, this is so boring. And then I saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is so good. You know, and it was like nothing changed, just the context. Using visuals for video games is really helpful because it's like, oh, well, I know exactly what's happening in that moment and it's much more impactful. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. And I also think that uh, going back to what you said about uh, Butterfly, but I sort of had a pretty similar experience in that when I started listening to to Puccini, I liked his music, but he wasn't one of my favorite composers mm. until I started having the opportunity to see his music live more. Something about Puccini and, and Wagner, especially those two, you know, I feel like they really lean on that because I'm like total work idea and that like Orman's storytelling thing. And the Verismo guys in general, I think too, you know. I mean, that's one of the really exciting things about Puccini for me anyway, is that there is this sort of, uh, it was quite influenced by Wagner. He had this yeah, yeah. language from, from Verdi in the Italian tradition on the one hand, but then also this other, you know, Wagner with these light motifs that are associated with such and such mm-hmm. a character or idea or some keep coming back and transforming and uh, Puccini really did understand how to take that idea and sort of appropriate it that same sort of like Wagnerian light motif thing it's one of the reasons that I think those first uh, Star Wars movies work so well I'm sure you've seen these videos on that some of them that exist on, on YouTube where somebody took takes a scene from Star Wars and you watch the scene without the <laughs> without the door. Yeah. And some of them are absolutely hilarious. And we realized that like, at what point he was really doing a lot of the filmmakers' work at the end of A New Hope. I mean, without John Williams, there is nothing <laughs> happening uh, in this scene. Everybody's just walking in silence. He's walking about, yeah. Floors, people clap at some strange moment. You know? And the, the music is just the most triumphant sort of like... Yeah. Uh, It's hard because yeah. that song is such a banger that I want to listen to the whole thing every time. You see how much is going on and like how it really, the music is essential to aiding that sequence. And like, this is the God of money and wealth and, you know, balance and things. Composer is going for something super sort of like explosive in terms of like uh, a, a real sort of like a rival. So you have tons of elements, like sort of rhythmic elements. And this is, uh, and I guess it's, if it's multiplayer as well, you've got tons of people participating in the same in the same battle. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So sort of this is a galvanization piece, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Yeah, that's true. It does have that sort of element of like fun to it as well. That's mm-hmm. not the, that some games that are, you know, kind of take on more seriously that sort of like epic. There's not that feeling at all in like the Elden Rings soundtrack, for example. <laughs>
me want to know more about the character you can feel that there's something to that story these are obviously incredibly well constructed uh games things are never as black and white as just some yeah but I, I thought this was super interesting about the the elden ring story and every time i've got, I played the game a, a bunch of times and every time i had to to confront Malekith, I kind of felt bad. <laughs> we quite like him. We feel bad for him. This sort of gave me uh, similar sorts of vibes in the sense that I'd like to know more about this. Something about the sort of the texture of the strings. Then when the you know when we get the vocal writing in as well, there's you know it's it's tugging on those on those sentimental strings. For me, I put that on the top of the list of what we chose. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> They'll be happy to hear that. Well, it's, man, now I really want to play Bloodborne. <laughs> <laughs> I took a stab at uh, Sekiro. Oh and, God! And, and not good, good enough to. I, I got about halfway through and was just like, I'm going to have to get better. One day, one day I'll come back and finish what I started. But I don't know how I'm going to get good enough to, you know. To, <laughs> I found that to be super interesting because that is just like absolutely unequivocally a skill issue. Um, <laughs> where, where, West mix to it. All this percussion is, is is really super fun. Sort of vaguely Eastern sounding kind of you know flute like uh, sort of things. Very, very yeah, cool, cool track. Do you hear the sort of Mozartian Bach? Da dum si mor latum. Yeah, it's sort, of, like, sort of the melodic patterns that kind of. Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I mean, sort of by the more sort of Western element. Western, music. yeah. You clued into the Eastern portion because this character Scaramouche is from Inazuma, which is their representation of Japan. And then you tap in this like robotic quality because he literally is becoming, he's become a false God. And so he steps into this mech, this mechanical giant creature. The electronic. It, sort of influence his mother is the electro archon or the electro god of inazuma and then on top of that you have the singer who's actually the composer which i love uh yu peng chen if you listen it's actually like it has this leggero tenor quality to it because he's young and so it's actually like really like plaintive because he's actually deeply sad inside even though we don't see that when we're fighting him because when we're fighting him we're fighting this giant thing so when you put all that together it's like it's amazing. I like that touch there as well. That I mean, obviously, I uh, uh, I wouldn't have known if, if you didn't tell me that, that, that that's the composer singing. It's a nice voice, but it's not a sort of like um, trained, fully sort of like trained kind of. And so it has this sort of like uh, fragility to it, which is quite, uh, which is touching. Really, it, uh, it, it serves the material. It's funny you say that, though, because they created a live version and the uh, singer is an Italian baritone and he's he's very good. But I came away with it kind of frustrated, whereas Yu Peng Chen singing, like you said, it's very gentle and uh, it almost has a naive quality to it. But I was frustrated with the live performance because they got like a very legitimate sounding opera singer. And a lower one at that, which made even it was a, a contextually it didn't make it didn't make much sense to me, and I was frustrated by it because of what you just said. The voice that's going to be best 
for such and such a situation is not necessarily the, uh, well, not always the best singer. Luxurious orchestration, the, the, yeah. the, like, you know, the you know the sister of like the you know Goldfinger main theme or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something about that. Bum 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 bum. What a thrill! That, based on the theme song alone, I might have to play it. <laughs> I'm learning all kinds of stuff today. I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> The character's name, Jin the Virtuoso, is that right? So of course they have to <laughs> virtuosic string play <laughs> because that's what maybe the instrument we most uh, you know strongly associate with sort of like virtuoso uh, you know virtuoso playing. Isn't it interesting that they choose the gun, the gun cocking and shooting as the instrument in the beginning? That, that is a, you know a shocking little uh, little little detail. Nice touch. This song is not about Jin, which I thought it was. It's actually about his his victims it's the last thing that they hear essentially before they they die oh yeah okay. or so it was told to me in the comments when I, when i posted because i thought it was like oh i feel guilty i'm looking at myself in the mirror i feel this sort of way and everyone was like no <laughs> no it's so fun when when it subverts your expectations you know very much like this when there's some sort of twist on the story that really changes the way you're the speaker as, as, as well. That this sort of the, the, this, he's really a virtuoso, uh, you know, killing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. extremely sort of like elegant, uh, you know, music to be associated with him. It's, it certainly is creepier, yeah.
That's really nice. I only see why that would make it onto a gym playlist. Which <laughs> <laughs> it's really nicely constructed, you know, the you know, when you get this theme and how it feels so different when you have this more rhythmic uh syncopated uh you know percussion mm -hmm. there's something about that that has this sort of like meditative uh, sort of like focus to it right but uh, i like that i really like how i can hear the rawness of the vocalism like there's the breath and you feel there's a lot of imperfection in the and i love that i love that because it's so raw and real and yeah. honest you know yeah yeah I, I i like this uh in in all kinds of music actually I don't want it. I think one of the things that's a little bit of a problem with uh, our, maybe the, the, the time in which we live nowadays is that there's so much sort of emphasis on sort of like airbrushing everything, being either yeah. photos or recordings, the same thing. It can be like putting bleach over everything. It kills something sort of really important. And I like, you know, old recordings that have these imperfections in them because it keeps something real despite the imperfections. Yeah, this is a nice piece. I, I, I really like this. Well, we have about like four pieces left. So I guess this would be a good time. I guess, Robert, do you need to talk a little bit about yourself? I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Had the good fortune to uh, grow up in a public school system. Had a really excellent music program and really good teachers. And we were all encouraged to take up an instrument around fourth grade and for me, it, this was just like, uh, you know, bas basically love at, love at first sight. And I kind of knew that I my future would be wrapped up in music in some way or another. I ended up going to conservatoire in Cleveland. Ended up going to study conducting in London. And then I needed a job. And uh, as after after leaving the academy, I was lucky enough to find a job in, in Montpellier in the south of France, which was pretty much a dream place to live. And kept that job for a few years and then was hired by a different house, a smaller house in France, but to be the main conductor. And that is where you and I met mm -hmm. in thousand. Nineteen. So I've been living in uh, Europe now since about 2000, I guess 2003. It's mm -hmm. been a pretty wild ride. For those of you that are that don't know, it's it's it is hard to have a career in the music industry, and certainly you know Robert. I mean, you've been doing this for so long, and and especially as a conductor, I feel like you know you're touring, you've done gigs, you know, everywhere pretty much in Europe. And do you ever feel like it's uh gets too hard, or do you still feel like now, you know, 20 years out now, right? It, it still feels really satisfying every day. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> put you on the spot there. <laughs> it's one of those fields that has a lot of ups and downs, right? When we're working on a project that we're really, uh, you know, deeply into and feel very passionate about the highs can be extremely yeah. high. This is actually something that I find that's, a, that's very difficult to kind of deal with because you can't just have these dopamine highs. Every high is followed by a sort of like mm -hmm. crash Hello. down afterwards. Yeah. And it's extremely difficult to em emotionally to handle this sort of like up and down. The fact that there's sort of no stability. And I guess in this, you know, voice acting, I'm sure is kind of the same. You're always thinking about your, yeah. Yeah. Your next gig, the thing, you know, there's a, you're getting accepted, you're getting rejected. And it's yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. all the time. And, and learning to sort of like in that Rudyard Kipling poem, when he talks about sort of treating those two imposters the same, you know, <laughs> success and failure, basically, because mm -hmm. it's true. Sometimes something that doesn't go well uh, is actually the, the biggest present you can receive. The thing that kind of frustrates me, even though I'm glad it happens, is that they have these video game music live concerts, which are great. They're packed i went to one in november in boston it was amazing all music for final fantasy i literally was like a kid in christmas it was it was wonderful yeah, but yeah. i wish that we would program them in a regular symphony because i actually think that programming would actually draw in a crowd and i went to this performance when i lived in dc and the conductor was like we came to you now you come to us and i felt like that is the complete wrong way to go about this because you you're alienating a, a huge swath of society. You know, it's just like weird classical yeah. versus everything and else. It's, it puts up another sort of like, uh, you know, I mean, I kind of get where he's coming from, but it just, it puts up a wall and the wall is unhelpful. It, it does sort of make it into, you know, you know, our camp and, and their camp. And yeah, I, right. I did one concert in that, that I was able to program because this was with, with my, with my old orchestra in, hmm. in Bosch, and we had the idea to do a film music concert. Mm -hmm. which I have conducted uh, a tremendous amount of, but I really, you know, I am passionate about movies and I am passionate about the the role that good music can 
uh, yeah. you know, can play in movies. When we were discussing this, uh, eventually we came with the idea of not doing an entire film music concert, but to do a, a concert where we, yeah, we had some film music, but we also had some film music by, uh, by a composer who uh, started his career just writing for, you know, orchestra and oh. for the opera, and also to include some excerpts from a piece that is not a piece of film music, but that very heavily influenced uh, film music composers. And I was quite pleased with this program because it would have been so much easier in a way to just program all film music. But then we would have had a, an audience that it would have been a little bit like maybe what that conductor uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Was, was talking about. That's like, uh, we're, we did your stuff, now you come in and hear Yeah, it. we did your pops, so now, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we wanted to do a concert that was a little bit more like Actually, the, a lot of this stuff is connected. It's definitely got that sort of like epic sort of uh, uh, vibe to it somehow. When you start to get that, uh, you know, the the Hans Zimmer style sort of like syncopated percussion thing going in, it really adds to that sort of like <laughs> massive uh, showdown sort of uh, feeling to it. In Monster Hunter, there's this famous motive called Proof of a Hero, and it appears in every single uh track the watch musical motive that appears no, in every track oh yeah oh yeah in oh. every in every major boss battle i want to share this with robert but the problem is this will get copyright claimed at least it has in my previous video so if you want to check it out go check out the full version this will not be in the edited version sadly and so when you're fighting them in that final phase where you have a moment where you may not make it and then proof of a hero comes on and it's like let's go baby you know fight the fight and so every time it appears you know it like galvanizes people and it's like yes yes I can you know what I mean? It's so satisfying. Yeah, it, it definitely has that uh, the, a bit of uh, John Williams vibe to it, and yeah. which is just uh, which is excellent. <laughs> it kind of like yes. sends you off, you know what I mean? When I finally got the chance to sort of to to do a concert where I had a bunch of John Williams pieces on it, and I could finally like look at the scores and actually sort of like study how he wrote it, I was absolutely amazed at how the detail of what uh, of uh, of what he was asking for and and the way he constri and he constructs it both in terms of the the themes but also you know certain rhythmic ideas certain orchestration ideas uh, mm -hmm. you know harmonically like really a, a, a real master That's actually a motive right there. That stomping is called the cabal stomp. It's actually an emphasis of a melody for something else. They layer melody really beautifully. Nice That's use of the, of the soprano here. We don't know, but because of course, it, this is when you're gonna, if you're trying to evoke something this sort of like angelic sort of lao, <laughs> so really effective. But of course it's always good when they're trying to, when they're trying to tap into that, it's always going to be a soprano, right? <laughs> <laughs> I asked, I said, why not a tenor? <laughs> He was like, mm. it just because yeah. it, ma it mixes in too much with the other instruments, and so it tends to get lost, which is really interesting. Yeah, it's totally different. But and if it's only an instrumental track, and they're they're going for that sort of like ethereal, yeah. it's not going to be 
uh, a cello, which is more, you know, closer to a, a tenor voice or something like that. Yeah. For the sake of uh, showing you live motives in video games. So here's Battle Ready from the same from the same expansion. There's that motive, right? But you hear how they take that same whatever that light motive light motive is of of lightfall from the main theme, they take it and they thrust it into this. And there's also like three other motives in here that you don't know the references to, but I do. And it's like they they just like are like, here, put that, put that, put that. And it like it causes this sort of like, you know, this this feeling of like, yeah, let's go, baby. And it, you know what I mean? It, it gets you mm. that's uh, something that's super exciting, especially once you start to know, you know, when you have more of the references, then it's like how, how old were you when the when the Phantom Menace came out? You I were, must have been like eleven. I was quite quite a quite a bit older, but I remember when we started to hear some of these like shadows of uh, of themes that we know from you know from from the original trilogy, but we could see you know we could hear John Williams sort of like telling the story about what's going to happen in the sort of next one. I can imagine that the more you know about it, the more yeah yeah this feeds it this feeds into it because it's it taps into something that you know already. When you described this kind of the general, general mm -hmm. name, this was not what I was expecting. Well, and humanity has been driven under the earth, if I recall correctly. And so someone is always moving on the surface. I think it means like the mechs are traveling over the surface of the of the land, but there is nobody else around. And so it has this strange melancholic quality to it that I that I find hypnotic in the way that Philip Glass would be. You know, it has this yeah, very exactly made me think a little bit of um uh Philip Glass uh Probably a little bit more Philip Glass than Steve Reich, but certainly this sort of like this minimalist having a figure, repeating it, repeating it, and then sort of changing in this sort of kaleidoscopic way what's what goes around it. It is strange that minimalism can touch the spirit that way. Because I was a little bit resistant to this music, and I had a friend who was deeply into it and who who was trying to get me into it. And he thought that the best way to do that would be to – he invited me to play in this piece in a concert he was organizing. Oh. And it lasts about an hour. It's so you really have to get into the yeah. Get into it. And yeah. That, that was the best way to you know to feel that it's a big world. There's a lot of ways to to make good yeah. music. Yeah, coming away from this, you know, based on your experience, like has this changed your perspective of video game music on the whole? I mean, I've discovered a lot of stuff today and a lot of different approaches to it. And and some of it I would need to understand a little bit more to the context would, would help sort of add into my appreciation. Bloodborne in particular really made me want to, you know, go find a PS4 somewhere. And like, <laughs> Do you think that you would program video game music in a concert along with uh, Beethoven? I love the idea of mixing up some genres. As long as yeah. it's... It, it, it's got to be done. It's got to be done well. I guess lastly, I, I think I already know the answer, but was there a piece today that stuck out to you? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Bloodborne. But uh, <laughs> um, there you go from self fans. You got another one. Although he he sort of already was, but now even more so. Yeah, so now no, he's I mean, really in the deep end. Really. I mean, Elden, Elden Ring really did, really did blow me away. And, uh, and Dark Souls 3 also was really fantastic. And someday I'll get good enough to play Sekiro. And also, I learned a little bit about that that sort of world and some of these like absolute uh, maniac streamers who do, who who do <laughs> these who do these like these soul level one runs. Well, listen, Robert, I really appreciate it. This is a very long, very long. I think this is the longest one, uh, two hours and fifty minutes. It's really great to see you, and it's great to share this. Thanks so much for uh, for inviting oh. me on. Was of pleasure. course, of course. And everybody, if you want to check out more, uh, feel free. I'll link Robert's uh, website down below. And if you're in France and want to check out an opera, definitely check out Opera de Limoges. And yeah. uh, 
or anywhere else really it's 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 great and uh yeah thanks a ton robert and uh see everybody bye see ya